morning, everybody. We welcome one another to the worship of God. And what a pleasure it is for me to be back at Long Causeway after almost three years. That's one of the reasons why I'm starting with some words from Psalm 95. The psalmist there says this, let's raise a joyful song to the Lord. Let's come into his presence with thanksgiving. Then again, we probably all of us know some people who aren't able to do that. So we also begin with a hymn whose opening words say this, O oh Christ the healer, we've come to pray for health, to plead for friends. You're going to see words as well as audio visuals on the screen. And please feel free to either sit or stand as you see fit. And although you can't sing, I know that. Nevertheless, please do feel free to hum along under your mask if you want to. now but I don't know how many of you found that typeface too small if you did apologies one of the perils of trying to do things in a way different from what we're familiar with let's pray God 
God said, be still. And know that I am God. So that's what we do as we pause to try to take in the fact that God's here with us now. God, our Father, we've come here to worship you. And yet, sometimes we feel we're just not very good at it. We wish we knew more about your power that can if you wear glasses or contacts. from nothing, more about your intelligence that can devise all the parts of a human body, your wisdom that knows all the motives in a human heart, and your love that goes on providing for us despite all our failings. Because your generosity gave us a free will, and that free will too often puts self first. When your commandment is to love God first and to love other people every bit as much as we love ourselves. But we know that all that's necessary to create strife is for two people to put self first. And we know that we've made our own contribution to the selfishness, to the strife that's in this your world. We know that grieves you. So it grieves us as well. And yet that love of yours shines into our sorrow, your love that sent Jesus 2000 years ago to pay the price for our selfishness by dying for us on the cross. So we give you thanks for the gift of his life and his death, for the presence of your Holy Spirit here with us now, for the promise that we are forgiven as long as we forgive other people. And as we thank you for that greatest of your gifts, so we thank you too for the everyday blessings in our lives, for adequate and varied food, for the roof over our head, for friends and for Christian fellows, for all these things and so much more. We're grateful and we ask you to accept our gratitude. We ask you too that you'll accept this our worship and remain with us throughout this morning. We ask it in the name of your son who's our savior Jesus Christ, who suggested that when we pray, we might like to use these words. Either we pray them silently to ourselves, or we just quietly beneath our masks. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> I wonder how many of you know which special Sunday this is. Actually, I can think of three reasons why today's... We might come to your answer in a second, is that all right? Because I think your answer is going to be the most important one of three reasons why today's special. Is that okay? Right. Reason one out of three... I've been planned at Long Causeway. Well, that's special for me. I don't know whether it is for you or not. Second reason is that today marks the end of Refugee Week. That's why today is called Sanctuary Sunday. And it's suggested that today we might pray for all people who've had to flee from their own home or their own country. 
But there's a third reason, isn't there? Why is today special? You're a long way away, aren't you? I think I heard that. Did you say Father's Day? Exactly right. It's known actually in our house, it's called Fathering Sunday, but most people call it Father's Day. Um, so if it's Father's Day, I, I'm not sure how many young people we've got, but have any of them got their dads? Have they come this morning, their dad? What? Yes. So where? Behind you. Behi is this a pantomime or what? Be oh, there. Is that him? Are you going to be doing anything special for Father's Day? Or is that a secret? You do know what Father's Day is for, don't you? It's for pretending, it's for, actually it's for persuading your dad to do something that you'd like to do and then claiming it's a treat for him. That's right, isn't it? Anyway, because it's Father's Day, we've now come to a story where one father is trying to do his best for his son. This is a Bible story, by the way, so somebody's gonna read this story. Marilyn, in fact, is gonna be reading from the gospel as it's told by Mark. We're in chapter nine in Mark and starting at verse 14. What you need to know actually is at this point, Peter and James and John have just been up Mount Tabor with Jesus and seen Jesus transfigured. That's what we hear about on a different Sunday. But this is what happens after that. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by the spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has, it has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, Take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, 
This kind can come out only by prayer. Amen. Before we spend a few minutes thinking about that passage, could we bow our heads just briefly? Father God, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. And what we are not, please make us. For Jesus' sake, amen. In the old version of the lectionary, what we just heard was the gospel reading that was linked to the other ones that are set for today. And I've chosen it not just because on Father's Day it's got this father trying to do his best for his son, but mainly I've chosen it because it seems to me to have some important things to say to us about the situation that we've all found ourselves in during the pandemic. Most of the commentators seem to think that the condition that the boy in this story is suffering from and that Mark is trying to describe is epilepsy. And when his father brings the boy to the disciples and asks them for help, I imagine that what he says to them is something along the lines of, I don't understand, I can't cope, this thing's too big for me, help me. Well, over the last 15 months and more, there's been millions of people who've lost jobs or gone bust or been unable to meet relatives or been forced to shield at home, missed out on education, missed a medical diagnosis, been bereaved, not been able to hold a proper funeral, or whatever. And I've wondered amongst them how many of them have also said things like, I don't understand, I can't cope, it's too big for me, help me. Well, in our story, how did the disciples manage then? Look at what the boy's dad says in verse 18. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they couldn't. I asked them to drive it out and they couldn't. I'm not blaming them, because I suspect that we might not have done any better. So if I'm right, why might we also have failed? And why did those disciples in fact fail? And for the answer, it seems to me, we've got to go back a bit. We've got to look at the context in which this all happens. Because by now, Jesus has spent some time already teaching them and training them, the disciples, to understand what following him is going to entail. And for them, it entailed, amongst other things, trying to bring release, trying to bring healing to other people. So then, earlier on, Jesus has actually sent all of them out, the disciples, early in chapter 6. He sends them on a mission. Mark actually says in verse 7 of that chapter, Jesus sent them out two by two. He gave them authority over evil spirits. Well, the disciples did their best to obey. For a while, they succeeded. Verse 13 says they did drive out many demons. They anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Now, I realize that the way we see things, the way we go about things in the 21st century is a bit different from that. But that doesn't actually matter, it seems to me, because what's clear is that the disciples were able to set some people free from 
whether it be physical or mental or spiritual hang-ups. So why then, when it comes to the story we just heard, why were they defeated by this epilepsy in this boy? Jesus, after all, manages to cure the boy. So as we heard, when they get indoors, the disciples ask Jesus in verse 28, why couldn't we drive this spirit out? And you remember Jesus' answer in the last line of what we heard? This kind can come out only by prayer. Only by prayer. Now, again, I realize that's an answer that raises a lot more questions. No doubt Jesus meant it to. He probably did want to pursue the conversation. So what does Jesus actually mean when he says that? Again, there's only one thing for it. We've got to go back to the context because you see, twice after the disciples have come back from these missions earlier on, twice Jesus has actually shown them that they and he need to spend some time alone with God. And on both those occasions, you can read about them in chapter six, that time of taking quiet with God is actually followed immediately by demonstrations of Jesus' power. The first time it's the feeding of the 5,000, and the second time it's the stilling of the storm on the Sea of Galilee. And it's not long after that, in chapter 8, if you want to check, that Peter finally acknowledges that Jesus is the Messiah. So Peter becomes the first one to cotton on. So, well, then where's Peter whilst most of these disciples are failing to cure the boy with epilepsy? Well, along with James and John, what Peter's done is he's followed Jesus' advice. Because these three, what they've done is to draw aside from the throng, aside from the rest of the disciples, They've climbed a mountain with Jesus. They've seen Jesus being transfigured. That's earlier in chapter 9. And of course, it's Jesus returning with these three disciples who heals the boy. So what's that telling us about all the rest of those disciples? After all, They've tried to be obedient to that mission Jesus has given them. They've got busy. But what they've done is to leave out any spiritual dimension. They've forgotten about the quiet time. They've forgotten about the prayer. So what does Jesus say at that last verse? We just heard, this kind can come out only by prayer. In other words, we need to tune in to God's own wavelength. We need to know the mind of God. May the mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day by his love and power, controlling all I do or say. So what I asked was, would we have done any better? I wonder. Yes, those of, us, those of us who belong to non-conformist churches, we are excellent activists very often. Well, a lot of people are. And there's nothing wrong with that unless we end up being too busy to pray. Are we too busy to pray? When we pray, do we listen and look, or do we just gabble? On the whole, the church doesn't lack commitment, but sometimes we go straight from that commitment to the activity without that transfiguration experience in between. The sequence for Peter, remember, was commitment, contemplation, 
and then activity. We need that experience of contemplating that glory of God that Jesus represents. If we miss out on all of that, we miss out on the very thing that gives us any power. And there's plenty of churches where a coffee morning or a jumble sale or a musical always brings out the volunteers. But do those same people come to a prayer meeting? Do they come to a Bible study? Not on your Nelly in some cases. During the pandemic, of course, we've not been able to hold that sort of social event anyway. But what Jesus is saying here is that the secret of those disciples being unable to heal the boy is they've forgotten the prayer. And that prayer's what's essential. And what do you know? That's one of the things that the pandemic hasn't prevented us from doing. So when we emerge from the pandemic, it's going to be interesting to see whether things are any different on that front. Our relationship with God mustn't be separate from our activity. It's got to imbue what we do because that is the source of its power. And the logical conclusion to what Jesus is saying is if the church, that's all of us together collectively, if the church lacks power, then the explanation must be has to be that what's missing is that spiritual dimension. I said earlier that there are people out there, millions of them throughout the pandemic, people asking in their individual problems, I don't understand, I can't cope, it's all too big for me, help me. So if we're Jesus' followers, are we in a position to help them, or aren't we? Or is, is it all too big for us as well? Confession. I'm going to own up. I can't cope. It's too big for me. But I don't care because it doesn't matter, because it's not too big for God, even if it is too big for me. And what matters is not actually how big our faith is. What matters is how big God is. So that's why when we come to our prayers of intercession, what we're going to do is to place into God's hands the things that we can't do to place into God's hands all of our concerns, our friends, our family, all the things that trouble us, the sort of people that we're trying to be. On this occasion, I suggest we stay seated because David's going to lead us as we do so. Again, we can follow the words on the screen. This time, probably they are big enough typeface for you. It's 519 in Singing the Faith, but I think you're probably familiar with it. Father, I place into your hands the things that I can't do. Father, I place into your hands the times that I've been through. Father, I place into your hands the way that I should go. For I know I always can trust you. Father, I place into your hands my friends and family. 
Father, I place into your hands the things that trouble me. Father, I place into your hands the person I would be, for I know I always can trust you. Father, we love to see your face, we love to hear your voice. Father, we love to sing your praise and in your name rejoice. Father, we love to walk with you and in your presence rest, for we know we always can trust you. Father, I want to be with you and do the things you do. Father, I want to speak the words that you are speaking to. Father, I want to love the ones that you will draw to you. For I know that I am one with you. So we do come to our prayers and we'll use as a bidding and response that same exchange that passed between Jesus and the father of the boy in our story. When I say then the words that Jesus used where Jesus says everything is possible for a person who believes, would you like to respond, mutter if you must beneath your mask or at least respond in spirit by saying what the boy's father said using though the word we rather than i we do believe help us to overcome our unbelief shall we practice that before we start everything is possible for a person who believes we do believe help us to overcome our unbelief Let's pray. Father, we place into your hands the things we can't do. Father, we place into your hands the way that we should go. We confess then that too often we try to do things in your name without first getting to know your will and your mind. And for that we're sorry. And together we pray for our church, for all the people who hold some kind of office here. All the things that happen here. That together as a fellowship and as a community, we might try to know your will and your mind rather than assume that we must have got it right already. Everything is possible for a person who believes. We do believe. Help us to overcome our unbelief. Father God, we pray for the peoples of your world, thinking especially of those in countries where there's war or where there's civil unrest. And we ask you to give wisdom and grace to those in power in every country so that they might pursue justice and peace for the people in each of their own countries. Everything is possible for a person who believes. We do believe. Help us to overcome our unbelief. Father God, we pray for all people in need. For people who are homeless or unemployed. 
on this Sanctuary Sunday at the end of Refugee Week, we remember those who've had to flee from their own country. We pray for those who suffer from grinding poverty. We pray for people who are ill. And we name before you this morning Chris Palmer and Edith Campbell. People who are lonely or neglected. People who feel that they can't cope. People who feel that the problem they have is too big for them. That they might know that even if it's not too big for them, if it is too big for them, it's not too big for you. Everything is possible for a person who believes. We do believe. Help us to overcome our unbelief. And Father God, we pray for the community of which we are part. We pray for all fathers and indeed all families. Relationships within those families, relationships between fathers, between all parents and their children. We pray for all who rejoice as well as all who despair. And we know that this week in, we shall be meeting people in the shops, in the street, in their home, maybe in our home. So for all people who are our neighbours in Christ, that we may serve them as Jesus would and love them as they are loved by you, for whom everything is possible. Everything is possible for a person who believes. We do believe help us to overcome our unbelief. God, our Father, you've promised that when people meet in your name, that you're there and that you hear what they have to say. We ask then that you'll answer our prayers, not necessarily in exactly the way that we ask them, but rather in the way that you know to be best for us. We ask it all in the name of your Son, who is our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So Jesus said everything is possible to a person who believes. And what do you know? In the closing hymn, Charles Wesley says something very similar. All things are possible to them that can in Jesus' name believe. But then he goes on, I can, I do believe in thee. So all things then are possible to me. Once again, we can follow this both audio and visual on the screen. Come along if you'd like, stand up or sit as you prefer.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.